Good morning, everyone. Pleasure being here. Thanks for the invite. So I want to talk today about behavioral economics. How many of you have heard kind of those buzzwords, behavioral economics, nudging, Taylor, Nobel, things, OK? Uh, but I want to actually talk about the intersection of what behavioral economics means in the digital age and what it means for you and you as each individual. I want to talk about personalization. And if you think, you think about behavioral economics, 34, 40 years ago when, when the field really uh, start, started, um, academics like me would go around and say, investors are, look at the mistakes they make. And we kept doing it for about 20 years until everyone started to say, OK, if you guys are so smart to understand that everyone else is dumb, what can we do about it? We need solutions. We don't need to actually show that people buy high and sell low. We need to figure out how to stop clients from buying high and selling low. So we moved into trying to have solutions, which I think is a lot more exciting than actually finding uh, you know, all the money mistakes we, we make. And a lot of the solutions, I think, will depend on the kind of technology we have and on personalization, because people are very different. And if there was one thing I would have you take away today, it would be how different each client is. And if you're a family and you're married, you could probably relate to how different you could be from your spouse, and how we could put all of this into a more personalized financial uh, plan that would really cater to what you need. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I want to start with a bit of behavioral economics. I'll try to do it quickly, but I really want you to be as excited, well, maybe half as excited as I am about what is behavioral economics and what it can do actually for people and their um, you know, <clears throat> financial well-being. Now, this experiment I'm going to talk about has to do with helping people save more money. I realize that this might not be the challenge you have. Uh, you know, as we progress in life, uh, some are lucky like you to have done well. And some of the challenges you will have would be more about you know, either how do I use it when I retire? Or you know, how do I transfer wealth in a sensible way to my kids and charities? Kind of what we call the decumulation. So I'll go through this quickly, but it might give you the power of behavioral economics, but also might be very relevant if you have a company with employees. How many of you have a company with employees that you own? So it's going to have a lot to do with those people who really you know, create the machinery for your company. So we were interested in helping Richard Taylor, who just won the Nobel Prize, and I were interested in helping people um, save money for retirement. Uh, why that problem, you might ask, why? Uh, because it's a very interesting problem of self-control. Most people tell you they want to save more money, and then they do nothing about it. So for a behavioral economist, it's a really interesting problem because people tell you they want to save money. They just, for one reason or another, go and keep spending it. We're in Beverly Hills, so I think some of you can relate to people who spend money they don't have, which, as we know, is easy to do in the US. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so what was the trick? We came with a solution. It was embarrassingly simple. We asked Midwest uh, blue-collar employees working for a manufacturing company, barely able to finish paying the bills every month. We asked them to save more. They all say they want to do it and say, we have no money. We can't do it. You're crazy. Go away. So we came with plan B. But it was very critical to know that they want to save more, because if you think about behavioral economics and nudging, who am I to have the right to move people in one direction if they don't want to go there? So the fact that they're telling me, I need help, I want to save, I just can't do it, is a really good starting point. So we told them, why don't you save in the future, tomorrow? 
And all of them were like, oh, we could do that. Next year, we're going to exercise, we're gonna eat less, we're gonna volunteer in the community, we're gonna do everything right, we're not gonna drive on Friday, you know, we'll do everything we want to do right next year. And it's something we call a present bias. Right now, it's very hard to resist the temptations, but our future self find it really easy to do the right things. So then we have a problem when. So we figured out it would be easy maybe to do it when people make more money. When they get the pay raise, they can save more and they don't need to trim their expenses. They don't have to feel the loss of not going out anymore. They have more money, they can take some of the pay raise and save it for their future. So that's a great plan, but nobody would ever implement it. Everyone would forget to do it when they get the pay raise. So we put it on an autopilot. As soon as someone said, I like it, every time they make more money, they save more money. So um, in this experiment, there were two um, groups of people. One group, they were saving more. They were saving about 6% of their pay and they didn't want any guidance. It was a small group of about 10% of employees. The others, jumped on the idea of having someone sit down with them. And we told them to save more today, and about one in five can do it. Most said, no way. So we're getting the leftovers. We're getting the employees who cannot save more today. 80% of them decided to save more tomorrow, almost all of them. The starting saving rate was low, as you would expect, those are people who struggle financially. Within four years and four pay raises, which were not very high, they virtually took the entire pay increase and put it into savings. They quadrupled their saving rates. If these were your employees, you would be able to let them go at 62 into early retirement without feeling bad, without all the challenges of other employees seeing them going home with no money. This is a life changer for them. Today, there are about 16 million people in the country on this program, and this is not really to brag about the results. We are probably more lucky at the right time, at the right place than anything else. If we didn't think of it, someone else would have. But um, it gives you the power. It actually lifted the US national saving rate by about 0.2 percentage points. So that's the power. And what are we missing? We're missing a lot of things. We're missing, first of all, speed and scale. I mean, this program to which uh, 16 million Americans took 20 years. Any of you would like an amazing business idea that might be successful in 20 years? Anyone? <laughs> Life's too short. So if we're gonna actually prevent clients from buying high and selling low, we can't have an idea that would take 20 years. They'll lose their money by then. So we need speed and we need scale. Yes, we affected 16 million people, but there are roughly 100 million Americans who still save too little. So there's a lot that could be done on every possible dimension. Um, to improve um, the financial well-being of Americans. So, uh, digital world, it's just because we need speed and scale. And also, that's where people make decisions. If you were to accidentally <coughs> cash out your lifetime savings, it would most likely be on a mobile device. So that's where people make decisions, and that's where we actually get speed and scale. So I'll give you a couple of examples of, I, I hate technology, so it's not that I'm excited about any of this <laughs> stuff. I mean, life, I think, was better before the so-called smartphones. And there's quite a bit of evidence showing that it makes us dumb, those smartphones, um, and actually bad investors. Um, <clears throat> but the digital world is there to stay. <clears throat> So what can we do with it? We could get this speed and scale. We could also personalize, and that's what I'm gonna try and convince you we could do. So this is a project 
that they've done with the US government. Uh, they have kind of a so-called nudge unit. Uh, they have a unit that tries to implement behavioral insights to help citizens and government employees uh, do the right things for their future. So we were trying to virtually figure out how can the government and employers get people to save more money. So we looked at all the different techniques that are out there. And we started with the obvious thing, tax. Hot topic nowadays, especially in California. Um, and we found that it's virtually useless. If the government spends a dollar on tax incentives for people to save, they would save a dollar and 24 cents. There's no leverage, it's, it's not very effective. You might as well just put the dollar in people's pockets rather than create the complicated systems with all the you know, accounting and, and same data from other countries. Tax is not the easiest way to make people save. The wealthy anyway save, and those who don't have don't understand the tax code, so it doesn't really impact them. You can't have something that you don't even understand or aware of really affect your behavior. Um, some of you, in your own companies, you might have matching contributions. Uh, the most optimistic view, the conflicting opinions, is that for every dollar you put in matching contributions, employees save another five dollars. More effective, but expensive. To get a typical employee to save another 5%, call it 3,000 bucks a year, you need to put 600 bucks a year into their retirement plan. And that's the most optimistic view. Financial education, a lot of people think it would solve everything, uh, but there's often a gap between education and action, right? I'm sure some of you have kids who have all sorts of things they know they shouldn't do, but they do that, right? Drinking and driving, huge issue in the US. Um, are those kids thinking that it's a good thing? They don't know that it's dangerous? They haven't been educated? No, there's a big gap between education and behavior. And <clears throat> financial education is not very effective. Most people, academics, would argue it has no impact. People who go and take two years of classes at high school about money management, they forget everything three months after the classes are over. Um, so it's not gonna get you the levels you need. We took one million people serving the country, soldiers and other people working for the Department of Defense. Uh, they don't save much. Uh, money is a big issue for that population. We send them a simple email that had basic behavioral insights, how little amounts accumulate quickly over time, especially if you earn some interest or return on it, and then where to take action. So the gap between good intentions and actions would be minimized. And we calculated all the cost of you know, designing the emails, having someone administer it, we got $1,600 of additional savings. <laughs> and there was primitive technology, emails. Half of it probably ended up in the spam. Half of it they just probably just click, you know, ignore. Um, there was not grabbing their attention with text messages, with anything that is video and a lot more vivid and emotional. So the sky is the limit. With a bit of technology, a bit of behavioral insight, you could really move the needle. And you could expand it to other domains. I mean, there are a lot of efforts <coughs> of companies to kind of figure out how to make people in California reduce their water and energy consumption and kind of experimenting with different, you know, tricks to do that and so on, healthcare. Huge issue, one of the biggest issues actually from a, uh, just a 
<laughs> behavioral perspective that we don't have good solutions is uh, people taking their medications. Half of the important medications that people actually bother to fill the prescription, pay, get the medication, they don't take it or don't take it on time. Including people who have critical conditions where the medications are known to solve the problem, they still don't do it. So there's a lot that could be done um, to help people, whether it's money, health, environment, other domains, education is a huge one where uh, there's a lot of effort to kind of crack the code on online education. Um, but staying in our domain, this is another experiment that we ran. I'll do it quickly, but it has to do with personalization and digital technology. So, um, so this is a, a startup, kind of what's been called a robo-advisor, uh, or one of those fintech companies that trying to you know, um, <coughs> cater to um, literally Silicon Valley employees. Um, if you look under the hood, a lot of those automated uh, investment solutions, algorithms, robo-advisors actually, they cater to people within five miles of their offices because it's the Silicon Valley crowd. Anyway, um, all of that is irrelevant. The main part is they gave their clients a dashboard that's showing you how much you spend, whether you're making more than you spend or vice versa. So it, you kind of get, in a sense, an income statement for your own personal life. And people had that available on the web. <clears throat> they used to look for the information twice a month. The only difference in our experiment, some people will get it on their mobile device as well. The same information, but the education and information would be, in a sense, just in time. So we're not changing the content, it's just the delivery mechanism. People started to use it every other day. Half of them used it in the mall. So if you match their locations, you could see that people using it in the mall. They cut their spending by 15 percentage points. The experiment went for four months, so you might have the usual concerns. It might be like a diet. It's so easy to lose weight, and then actually, if you look at the research, <laughs> gain it back plus more. It is actually, uh, there's some research on that, but at least for the four months that we had them in the experiment, this was dramatic. We didn't even tell them what to do. We only gave them just-in-time information, and they figured out at the mall, we noticed a huge drop in large purchases. That they would go in the mall and they won't buy the new iPhone or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so the sky is the limit. If that information was not personalized to their situation, we predict it would have been totally useless. So um, <clears throat> I think that's, that's about the main thing. We're going to have to put all these pieces together, some technology, probably some human interface, because I think there are things the machines would not do. Um, but we could leverage technology. We're going to put the behavioral inside inside, and we're going to try and personalize. And personalization is a lot more important uh, than people realize for two reasons. One, over the, the life journey, the individual differences grow dramatically, dramatically. I'm going to tell you a story about you know, my own family uh, and how I've seen it happening. And the other one, <clears throat> um, that the, the preferences are a lot more variable. The differences are much bigger than people realize. We're going to run a little exercise and might be able to illustrate it as well. So, the circumstances. <clears throat> uh, how many of you order stuff from Amazon? Excellent. How many of you have those, you know, healthy, young UPS drivers, or now we have the Amazon drivers as well, coming to your house delivering packages? Excellent. 
they're not that different if you look at them as just numbers, financial situations on a piece of paper. They're young generally, they're healthy, <clears throat> they got roughly the same income, and they should all probably save for their future. The differences are not huge. If we automatically, which UPS does, put them in a 401k plan, pick a well-diversified portfolio with low fees, and every year make them save more like save more tomorrow, 90% of the solution is there. Maybe one needs a bit more risk than the other. Maybe one can save a bit more. There might still be some differences, but we could get them on the right path. Fast forward, uh, when people approach 50, 60, 70, those UPS drivers are gonna be dramatically different. One would have had multiple heart attacks, one would be healthy, one would be obese, one would be skinny, one would have a family and kids and grandkids. One, God forbid, might have lost a spouse on, the, on, the, on that journey. The circumstances are dramatic. <clears throat> and we're gonna have to personalize that trick of kind of putting everyone in the same solution would not work. Um, there's a lot of debate globally about annuitization. And I'm not talking about variable annuities and kind of all those things that have tax benefits. I'm talking about just taking a pile of money, <coughs> giving it to an insurance company, and in return getting a paycheck every month for as long as you live. And this is not to say if it's a good or a bad product. It's not the point at all. Uh, but there are discussions about kind of pushing that so that people which retire and they're all going to be in those kind of products. The UK, 75% of people are. But imagine differences. My dad, when he was 80, was exercising every day half an hour on the treadmill. Was fit, was healthy, was still going to work. An annuity could have been a good deal for him. My father-in-law, when he was 70, he was the size of one of those tables, literally. I couldn't hug him and have my hands, you know, rich. Uh, he would have two dinners every night because he loved eating. So he would have a dinner at five, kind of a secret dinner, and then another one at seven. Um, he wouldn't exercise because that's a pain. He loved smoking. And annuity would have not been a good deal for him. And he did pass away a few months later. So the circumstances would vary. We're going to have to personalize, but the preferences are very different too. And that's what I want to focus on in addition. So we're going to talk about a few individual differences that I think are critical to a financial plan. If you think about the old days, um, you didn't actually have a financial planner. In the old days, those people, called them the money doctors, they were an investment advisor because the focus was mainly about investing. There wasn't kind of the bigger picture of how people are different. A good financial plan would have a huge focus on how much to leave to your kids. People have very strong opinion about it. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you a side story, a behavioral bias, actually, in that space. When I ask people who are super wealthy, call it, you know, $100 million of assets, who have a kid, one kid, I ask them, how much would you want to leave to your kid? Anyone wants to pick the most common answer? Five. Five million is like the typical answer, the rest for charity. When I ask Similar people who have two kids, how much do you want to leave to each kid? Do you want to pick an answer? 50. It's like, just divide it between the two kids, 50 and 50. So if it's one kid, it's five million. If it's two kids, there's a very simple rule of thumb, which is divide it equally. So it's 50 to each. <laughs> so, but that is, not necessarily about the investing, but the financial 
plan should include thinking about those kind of things and many more. So um, I'm going to talk first of all about how we feel about what people might call risk. But I'll call it actually loss and loss aversion, not risk aversion. And I'm not going to call it a risk tolerance questionnaire because risk is a bit vague. And a lot of the ways we measure risk out there are very, very problematic because <laughs> they sometimes look at variability for those who like you know, statistics. They look at standard deviations. Those measures assume that we hate negative surprises, but we also hate positive surprises, that we like everything to be predictable. Variability on the upside is as bad as variability on the downside. Well, most people treat gains and losses differently. Um, <clears throat> negative surprises are a lot more painful than positive surprises. Um, so we have to start thinking actually about losses and how people feel about losses. There's a very cute experiment that uh, Paul Samuelson, the Nobel laureate, offered more than 50 years ago to his MIT colleague at the time. So we're going to flip a bet. We're going to flip a coin. Either you win 200 or you lose 100. <coughs> so I got enough cash from the ATM on the way here. And I will trust that you guys, if you don't have cash, that you will pay me. How many of you, how many of you are willing to come up and play this game for real money? Anyone? How many do not want to come up and play? So first of all, you notice that even with a very simple bet like this, people feel very differently. Some would want to play. I've once given this talk, and I said, who would want to play? There were four people in the room running with the money to be the first, because <laughs> they, they, they would love to play this bet, and some would hate it. So people are different, and we'll get into more about that. Now, if you think about it as an investment, it's a spectacular one. You're going to put $100 at risk. Either you lose it, or you're going to get back your money plus 200 if you win. So if you do kind of an equivalent of a rate of return, you're going to make 50% return in two seconds. Uh, the interesting thing is it also doesn't have much risk. I bet all of you can afford to lose 100 bucks and still buy nice gifts for the grandkids. So, so we've taken now a bet that has 50% return and very little risk. And some people hate it, some people love it. So this all would be about how you feel about losses. That's all that this thing is going to be about. Now, how many of you have heard about kind of this idea, loss aversion, Kahneman and Tversky, anyone? So they've done a lot of work on it. Anyone knows, uh, kind of, if you think about the pain of a loss versus, versus the pleasure of a gain, is there a number? Can we quantify how sensitive we are to losses relative to gains? Are we two times more sensitive to losses, 10 times? Just 10% more sensitive, anyone? Two times, two times. So two times is the, the rule of thumb. If you look at the research, half the people would be 2.25, um, <clears throat> um, well, the median, but just call it the average for a second, uh, little statistical shortcuts that they shouldn't do. Um, but let's call it on average 2.25 is the sensitivity to losses versus gains. So about two times. Now, <clears throat> how many of you think that there would be your sensitivity to losses? That you would be two times more sensitive? Anyone? How many of you think you're going to be a lot more sensitive? Maybe you're five times more sensitive. How many of you think that you're not that sensitive to losses? So you see a lot of opinions. How many of you have no idea? <laughs> so we can actually measure it. We could easily measure it. Um, we've built a tool for Wisdom Tree. 
uh, and I've done this with John Payne at Duke University, who, uh, who spent literally 40, 45 years studying these kind of uh, decisions. And you're going to, in a sense, we're going to play a game with one of your advisors, and, and we're going to virtually make choices between different bets. In this case, there are two, A and B. There are always going to be two. And if you choose A, uh, either you win 500, or you lose 300, or you break even. We want to keep it simple, so each one of the outcome, one-third probability. So we don't have to worry about, you know, 12%. And on the right side, there's another bet, B. You could win less, 100, but you could lose less, 100, or you break even. And you eventually have to, every time, choose A or B. And we can actually very accurately measure your sensitivity to losses. So just looking at this bet, how many would have picked A? How many would have picked B? So you could see almost a bit of a split here. The reason, this is a bet that has a loss aversion of two. So we built it with some, for someone who is virtually twice as sensitive to losses versus gains. That's the point where people start splitting. Some fit the average, some don't. So what we're going to do next, we're actually going to uh, take your financial advisor, and we're going to go through some of this, and we're going to calculate his sensitivity to losses. And you could think virtually if his answers would fit you, or where would you completely disagree. Now, you could also play with it on your own later, um, but let's start seeing what we'll get. So what do we need? We need your year of birth. We'll make, it, make him very young. Let's go. Oh, that didn't happen, but that's okay. Let's go. You know the technology never works, right? So. We have plan B, just in case, because we know technology never works. OK, <clears throat> so here we have a slightly different um, display of those interfaces. Um, but again, you got the two gambles on the left, you know, you win 100, lose 100 on the right. You could win 350 or lose 300. Let's see what the audience thinks before we get our advisor to pick. How many would have picked one? How many would have picked two? Not many. So you could see that this is a bet for people who probably are not that sensitive to losses. They're willing to take it even though the upside is just a tiny bit more than the downside. But let's start calculating. Which one would you pick? I like gamble two. Two. We pick two. This one I think we've gone through. Which one would you pick? Gamble two. Two. We're going to do this quickly so we get to the, uh, to the results. I might uh, stop at the ones that are kind of more interesting. Um, okay, let's keep uh, let's keep going. Um, what are we doing now? Gamble one. One. Gamble two. Now he doesn't know that we're measuring if he's consistent one. too. <laughs> it's really important. Let's slow down here. Let's slow down here. So Gamble 1 now has 1,100 as the upside, 300 as the downside. And 2 is the usual plus 100, minus 100. How many would go for 1? How many would go for 2? Nobody. 
there are people who actually go for two. How many of you think they're nuts? You would ne so, so you feel strongly one should be what everyone picks, and some people are like, I'm not willing to take that risk, actually. So people are very different. Let's keep going. I'm guessing he's taking one. One. <laughs> Totally. So I'll, I'll address that. That's a great question. Okay, what are we doing? Two. One. Okay, let's see the results and then let's talk about adding zeros, making it a million or two rather than $100. <clears throat> so, um, he experienced gains stronger than losses. He's not averse to losses. Those people exist. Those people exist. Let me tell you a secret. About a third of the people are not that sensitive to losses. A third fit the average. They're like twice as sensitive. And a third are very sensitive to losses. Now, it raises a lot of questions like, what shall we do about it, is one thing. And the other thing is, what happens if these amounts would be a lot more meaningful? <clears throat> so I'll start with the, what shall we do about it, and then talk about why do we pick hundreds of dollars, not, you know, single dollars, and not thousands, tens of thousands, and so on. So, the first thing, if you create a financial plan, this should obviously affect how much risk you take. But that would be true on the accumulation side, as you're thinking what mix of whatever, ETF, stocks, bonds, international, domestic, small cap, large cap, how much in, you know, startups on the side, real estate, whatever <coughs> you're actually investing in. It would also have implications for the decumulation phase how much guarantees you have so you could, you know, pay all the basic expenses and never ever have to worry about it. If you're sensitive to losses, you're most likely sensitive to having to cut your lifestyle as well. It would also have implications for insurance and deductibles. If you're very sensitive to losses, you would probably want lower deductibles. If you're not very sensitive to losses, you want the highest possible deductible. The insurance companies generally make money on low deductibles. It's generally a very bad deal if you're not very sensitive to losses. It has a lot of implications for how your advisor would communicate with you. Markets collapse. <clears throat> it happened 10 years ago. It could happen today, in a year, in 10 years, who knows? I don't have a crystal ball. When markets collapse, I'll tell you a secret. Your advisor can't call everyone in the first hour. <laughs> so he has to prioritize. Well, if we know who's most sensitive to losses, we can call them first as an advisory show. And so on. So it's not just like the mix of you know, stocks and bonds. It should affect your entire perspective on the financial plan. And if you're buying vacation homes and taking mortgages, it should affect variable versus fixed rate mortgages and, and the entire thing. Now, the bets that I've picked um, are in the hundreds of dollars for, for a reason. We have two concepts in behavioral economics. One is the sensitivity of people to losses. We actually have three concepts, if you think about kind of how people think about risk. One is how you deal with probabilities. And we're not very good intuitively. We're not very good statisticians. So all of the bets I actually used have three outcomes, not two. And say, why? The middle one is always zero, so why do we really care about it? Just make it two outcomes. Actually, we're very bad 
assessing what the 50-50 probability is. Our intuitive self is massaging those probabilities so that 50% is more like 45. And then depending on which one of the two gambles you look at first, the gain or the loss, the other one gets a 55% probability. So now I can't actually judge any of the outcomes because it might be driven by how you massaged subconsciously the probabilities. Our intuitions are very good for one-third probability. We're not sure why, but we know that that's the case. So that's why we created bets with three outcomes. The next thing we know is that um, we need to pay a lot of attention to how sensitive people are to losses. If you try to measure it with cents or a couple of dollars, you can't because the amounts are trivial, so people won't even think about a bet where you could win two cents and lose a cent. So we have to start uh, making the bets bigger to the point where they're, you know, somewhat meaningful, like hundreds of dollars. What would happen, though, if these amounts were you win two million or you lose a million? That's another concept, which is risk. <clears throat> now there's real risk. I mean, maybe some of you, if you lose a million bucks, you won't be able to maybe keep paying the mortgage or keep your vacation home or whatever the thing is. And we have to actually measure what happens as we move from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands, which is another concept, and I don't want to mix the two to mix actually the risk and the loss aversion. Luckily, there aren't a lot of differences among people as you scale up the bets. So if I measure loss aversion, I normally know how to actually, behind the scenes with financial engineering, know what you would likely answer if I scale it to hundreds of thousands and millions. But if we want to do the best job, then we have to do virtually two, um, two tests to get the most precise answer. Okay, let's keep going. So, <clears throat> losses is probably one of the most, the most important uh, behavioral trait of investors. Uh, and, you know, that also applies if you, um, if you prefer to invest in real estate. I mean, we're in Los Angeles, so I'm assuming a lot of you also have some real estate investments. How many of you have real estate investment? So very, very typical of Los Angeles. The people who are more loss averse would not be willing to sell an apartment building at a loss. Even if it's a great deal and you could buy a nicer building <laughs> for what you'll be paid, the fact that you mentally had this price you paid and now it's less, the more loss averse people are the less they'll be willing to, um, you know, sell a, a property. Okay, next one. Uh, present bias, which you could think of as uh, immediate gratification. This is, um, <coughs> this is actually timely after a wonderful breakfast with lot, lots of temptations. Um, so this is a test where you virtually ask people if they want bananas or chocolates. How many of you, um, and, and the way it works, they say, next week we have another seminar here, and I want to order the food, so I need to know how many bananas and chocolates. How many of you next week would like to eat a banana? How many would go for chocolates? The normal split is like, 75% go for bananas. The week passes, we come back, we have another seminar, I say, I'm so sorry, I'm an absent-minded professor, I forgot what you told me. But just in case, I got a huge pile of chocolates and a huge pile of bananas, so go have whichever you want. And suddenly, people <laughs> switch, and they go for the chocolates. So this is the same of like, you know, I want to save, but then I end up spending. Um, <clears throat> now, turns out that this present bias, immediate gratification, um, 
huge variations across people. Some people have a very strong present bias. They live in the here and now. A lot of people are more balanced and some people actually have the other problem. They have a future bias. They always think about the future. They never live in the here and now. And those would have implications for a lot of financial decisions. This is a little tool we built based on research with people who retired. Um, I'll skip the questions because it's not the important thing, but this is a typical test that would assess if I do enough of these questions, I can assess if you have a present bias. The trait of people with a present bias, if I give you a question where you could have $1,000 right away or 1100 in 10 months, people with a present bias don't care about the future. They will take the here and now, they'll take the $1,000 today. You could actually increase it and give people like, you know, things that economically are crazy. It would be like 1000 today or $1,300 in 10 months. You're waiting 10 months, you're going to get 30% for sure. And people with the present bias would be like, no, I'll take a thousand today. Now, so far you might say, oh, maybe they don't have the money. Maybe, you know, they have a high discount rate. It's actually a different thing. We know how to differentiate because what we would do next will shift everything 18 months into the future. So the here and now, the thousand dollar, you now have to wait 18 months. And the bigger amount, you have to wait 10 months on top of it. So the economic decision is still the same. It's like there's a sooner amount, and if you're willing to wait 10 months, you'll get another 10% or 30%. But none of the options now is right away. People become very patient suddenly. Those are the people with the present bias. If one of the options is now, if it's a chocolate, now <clears throat> they'll take it. They won't be able to think of doing the right things. They're impatient. But if both options are in the future, they're like, oh, I can wait. What's the big deal? 18 months, 28 months, I can easily wait. So why are we bothering to identify those people and go through those tests? Turned out that people with a present bias are a lot more likely to retire too early. I'm not talking about money. You might have done incredibly well financially, and you have an amazing practice with 500 lawyers, and you're thinking whether you want to go play golf and sell the practice, or whatever your situation is. So you might have plenty of money. It's not about not having the money in retirement. They're just not happy. The golf playing looks a lot more attractive than it would be to those kind of people after they've played for two weeks and they're kind of, you know, really tired of that new lifestyle. So with those insights, one could have a more meaningful discussion about, is it really time for me to retire or should I keep the business? Those people actually two years into retirement, they're still very unhappy. So imagine it, we can predict the full test is only six questions, two minutes. We can predict the people who would be unhappy in retirement, and it's not because they lack money. It's because they have a present bias. I'm going to um, wrap this talk <coughs> with, uh, with the chocolate test, which is probably my favorite. Um, so there's, there's research about what we call hedonomics, um, which is kind of, you know, it's not so much about how much money you have, it's about how you use it or how you distribute it over time. Um, <clears throat> so in one of the, the questions you could, um, you could have, it's about your academic uh, outcomes and you have to choose between uh, being in the 80th percentile. Alternatively, you could start uh, low, you start at the 70th and you finish at the 85th. So your GPA would be lower in number two. It would be 77 percentile in, in number one would be higher. How many of you would rather pick one over two? 
how many would rather pick two over one? So a lot of people prefer actually uh, option um, two. <coughs> uh, they like to see an improvement. Uh, so it's not just the overall GPA, it's also the, the path. But people are very different. They're not all the same. So <coughs> this is a test that they came up with, and, and we'll talk about what it has to do with money. In the test they came up with, uh, one day I was in New York, and the hotel I stay in is very clever. They always give you a little gift. The gifts don't cost them anything, but I obviously remember it. So they learned about all the research about persuasion and how little gifts go a long way. Um, <clears throat> And they gave me a box with four chocolate truffles. My daughter was five at the time. So I go back home, I give her the box, and I say, you could have one every night for the next four nights. Which one would you like tonight? And she said, I want the, the white chocolate. I said, but you hate white chocolate. She said, yeah, I want to get it out of the way, <laughs> and, and I'll keep the dark one last. But the really interesting insight that she had for a five-year-old that really blew my mind was, but I don't think all the kids would do it this way. So she realized that there are individual differences, that some would like to eat their favorite first, and some would like to keep <laughs> their favorite last. And I mean, we're not very different. You could see, you know, it wouldn't be very different from people who kind of, you know, can't enjoy the dessert until they do the dishes from all the other courses first. Um, so some people like, you know, to <laughs> have the best first and vice versa. So I started to play with those kind of questions. I'm going to spare you, in a sense, uh, going through all of this. But it's virtually whether you pick your favorite chocolate first, because life could be too short, or whether you're the type that like life to get better and you keep the best last. What does this have to do, actually, um, with <coughs> um, the decumulation phase? So <coughs> you could imagine, actually, the exact same thing for how you would enjoy your money in retirement. So imagine three plans. One, every month you're going to have the same amount. So this is kind of whatever, a traditional annuity. We'll take a lump sum and every month you'll have the same amount throughout retirement. The other one would be if you think that life could be short. If you're that type, then we create another plan for you. We'll start with slightly higher income now. And as you get older, it's going to get smaller and smaller. Not necessarily dramatically, we could decide about the slope, but we'll have more now while you're younger, healthier, and less later. And the other plan is the life gets better plan. We're actually going to start retirement with a smaller amount, and we're going to build increases, so every time it's going to go up. Okay? And let's just stick for that for a second. And those are the only three options you have for your retirement, okay? How many would like the flat line, kind of every month, every year, it's going to be the same amount? Anyone? Yeah. Now, be aware, the plan that nobody likes is what insurance companies have been trying to sell unsuccessfully in the U.S. for the last 50 years. Nobody likes this. Most of the Monte Carlo simulations, the fancy things behind the scenes, assume Something like that. They might assume 70, 80% income replacement and maybe an adjustment for inflation, but put all of this aside. They're trying to put you on this boring path that behaviorally we know numb people, doesn't get anyone excited, of the same amount every month. How many of you think life is short, would like to start high, and then it could go down a bit over time? Anyone? Nobody. How many of you would like to start low and have it go up over time? So think about the differences here, okay? The common solution nobody likes. Only a handful of people. 
And there are a lot of people who actually prefer life to get better. If I had a bigger audience, more diverse maybe, you actually do find a lot of people who are also on the other side, prefer to start high and go lower. But we need to start including that in our plans. We can't just assume like the old days, a flat line. Now, the technology is there, both the financial engineering and figuring out your preferences. <coughs> that was not true in 1933 when the social security system was established. It was a miracle that they were able with, you know, paper documents to actually give a plan that everyone gets a similar formula and it's always flat. That was a big thing to administer, but we could do a lot better nowadays.